in Quebec's medical community. Next slide, please. We could not do this work without the um, support of our organizational partners from a, a wide array of family and um, healthcare institutions. And we are um, just want to express our gratitude to each of them for supporting our work, sharing our work, because that is how we're going to make change by spreading the word. Next slide. And a special thank you to our industry sponsor for this webinar, Draker, care for babies like never before. We have adopted the all-in meeting guide. This is uh, a guide that was developed by one of our executive council family partners, Jennifer Canvasser, who leads the Next Society. Um, their organization developed this guide as a way to um, break down the barriers and the hierarchy when you have meetings of all sorts that include healthcare partners and family partners. Um, it is a way to elevate the family voice, to highlight the importance of working together and building relationships across sectors in healthcare. And you will also notice that we will be um, referring to everybody by their first names. Next slide, please. Our Family Center Care Task Force is led by a core team that includes myself, Kira Sorrells, at, alongside um, Malathi Balasundaram and Colby Day. And we are, of course, held together by our program manager, Morgan Kowalski, who is also a family partner. Next. Speaking of family partners, we have a very robust executive council of family partners who are um, diverse as uh, in terms of their experience, their lived experience, their background. They are birthing and non-birthing partners that are all dedicated to elevating the family to their rightful place in the, uh, the center of the baby's care team. Next slide, please. And of course, we are working alongside uh, our healthcare partners, Executive Council, who also bring with them a breadth of knowledge and expertise and uh, various uh, practitioner lenses. We would like to welcome Christy Gliniak, who is our newest member of our healthcare partners, Executive Council. She is uh, a neonatal therapist and is the liaison for one of our newest organizational partners, the National Association of Neonatal natal therapists. Next slide, please. The work of our task force is done not only by our core team, but also our committees, marketing and communications, newsletter and advocacy, which are led by Daphna, Fergabi, and Carrie. Uh, we are doing a call to action to our family partners on their, our executive council. We are looking for family partner co-chairs for each of these committees. One of the things that makes our task force unique is that we are not just talking about family-centered care practices and policies at the bedside, but we are looking at these practices and policies as um, being interwoven to our organizational structure from top to bottom. So we definitely wanna have some family partners um, on these committees and chairing these committees to partner with those healthcare partners. Next slide, please. It's hard to believe it's already the end of the year, um, but we are delighted with um, our accomplishments for 2023. Uh, we have been able to um, move the needle forward, which we'll show on the next slide in just a minute. Um, but we have been able to provide six free educational webinars that features the work of our healthcare partners, researchers, and family partners. And we also have a small group model of five cohorts that meet bi-monthly um, from across the country and even across the world to discuss the barriers and successes in developing and strengthening their practices within their units. Next slide, please. So we are really pleased with our, um, 
our surveys that we've done at the beginning and um, kind of mid-year uh, to show the progress, the incremental progress, but progress that is important to share that um, our family-centered care committees and family partnership councils, the percentage of centers that have those and are actively engaging them has increased since being a part of our task force and being a part of our webinars and our learning community. So we are very excited about that. And we just thank you so much for uh, investing the time and the commitment that is needed to uh, advance this work. We're also very pleased to see um, the expansion of our listserv membership of over 700 um, individual healthcare and family partners. And as we shared before, we have expanded the number of uh, national organizations that we partner with, our engagement in our um, social media and website traffic has uh, increased month to month. And we have, again, six more educational webinars that will be free already planned out for next year. Next slide, please. We would like to take a moment and ask you to please scan this QR code or Morgan will also pop the uh, poll link into the chat box. This is our October poll where we are collecting information on the variation of practice of skin to skin holding across NICUs and want to learn more about those restrictions that may be in place. So please do go ahead and scan that QR code. Again, the link is in the chat and we'll of course share it out later as well. And finally, tw the 2024 Gravens Conference registration is already open. It will be held March 6th through the 9th at the Sheraton Can Sand Key, excuse me, Sand Key Resort. We hope that you will join us. Um, I will be there. Malati will be there. I know several other task force members will be there. We will have a workshop as well as an executive council meeting. So please go ahead and uh, register and we will hope to see you in sunny Florida in March. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Malati. Thanks, Kira. Next slide, Morgan. Hi, everyone. I'm Malati Balasandaram. I'm a neonatologist and one of the task force co-chairs. And we have two incredible speakers lined up for today's webinar. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Annie John Vie. So she is a neonatologist and clinical ethicist at the St. Justin University Health Center. She is a professor of pediatrics and clinical ethics at University of Montreal. She holds a PhD in bioethics and co-directs the master's and PhD program in clinical ethics at University of Montreal. She is also the parent of three children who had or have healthcare issues, one of which was born at 24 weeks. Our main research interests in bioethics are decision-making for fragile patients and family integrated care. She investigates family perspectives regarding intensive care decisions death and disability, and parent, family, or patient important outcomes after an acute stay. She has demonstrated many contrasts between provider and parental perspectives and examines how to improve our communication with families. She is author of many narratives and publications and books in clinical ethics and medicine. She wrote her own book featured here, Breathe Baby Breathe, her own experience as an acute parent. This book ends with practical recommendations for clinicians, parents, and families. I wish I'd read this book during my fellowship. Well, I think it's never too late to learn and change. So we are honored to have you here, Annie. Please take it away. So you can so stop sharing um, the screen, Morgan, so Annie can share. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Okay, it's really a, a privilege to be here and speak to all of you. Um, and I could see all the interdisciplinary amazing people in, in the chat. So thank you for being here. Um, when you're in ethics, you don't have any money to disclose. So not much. Um, but uh, I don't have any 
interest other than those of my patients. Uh, and I personally disclose uh, that I had a baby at 24 weeks and uh, my best pregnancy, which was an adoption for my third baby. Um, and so I, I went through there. So of course, there's you'll see p-values that are unbiased, but you might get my editorial uh, comments sometimes. So the objectives of today's talk is to understand the complexity of the family experience and to identify opportunities for improvement. And you all know everybody here that in the NICU, it's quite different than in medicine. There's trauma within the hospital and the hospitalization, but there's also celebrations. And you will see this. This is a picture of me um, when I had Violette. When she was actually better, we knew she wouldn't die. And you can see that the, I'm not the Mona Lisa, but I'm, I've am i got some half-ass smile, which is like shit's going to fall on my head, or it may be a good day. Um, and a lot of parents are like that in the unit. We see a lot of negative come out, like PTSD, depression, and there's many articles that exists to demonstrate that going through a hospitalization with a sick baby um, is associated with negative impacts. But it's also associated with positive transformation. Whomever is on the <clears throat> here who wants all these articles, write me and I'll send you the bunch that were in my presentation. And we can see some positive transformation. Um, some people call it post-traumatic growth, but for, for most parents, it's not a growth. You're just destroyed and you rebuild yourself a bit differently. So I'll speak about how to improve and I'll, I'll start with the basics of what can we do? What is the base of the pyramid to try to help families cope with the NICU hospitalization? And we often forget the base. And this is one of my favorite articles written by, it's, he's an internist, Dr. Khan in New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And he says, in medicine, we need basic medical human interaction. He called it etiquette-based medicine. And you can see them there. Introduce yourself, know the name of your patient, tell him her why, why you're here, ask them in their own words how they feel, explain why you need to do physical exams, if you need to do one. He had so many comments and criticism that he was like, you know, speaking to children, it was infantilizing. Of course, everybody does this. This is like basics. We learned this in preschool. So then his fellow did a research to see, oh, okay, do people really do that in medicine? So he had an observer look at how in clinicians, not just doctors, interacted with patients. And the, the clinician knew that the doctor was, the, the, per, the observer was there. And despite this, he demonstrated that with 30% of patients, none of these behaviors were used. And with the patients, in average, 22% only were used. And in general, people were not following the very base of the pyramid. When they were, patients were much happier. When they were, patients were more satisfied and had uh, less complaints. So it's really not that obvious. So I'm the every day that I'm in neonatology, I see these breaches. I see people coming in the room, examining a baby's tummy, getting out, not even acknowledging the presence of a parent or changing the respirator, not acknowledging the presence of the parent. Um, so we wrote that article with etiquette based in neonatology for the real big basics, using the name of the baby, um, how, you know, acknowledge the presence of the parents, how do the parents know who you are and the plethora of all the people that they meet, um, do you have somewhere to sit down um, to interact with them. So the, the basics need to be used before we get into very high voltage of family and into integrated care. Uh, the basics are often not used, unfortunately. So then what is the middle of the pyramid to help parents? Um, it's their parental sense of competence. And there's different ways to measure this. There's quantitative ways to measure this. And the uh, all the literature from Chris Futner to is extremely important in how do parents feel like good parents? 
their feeling of parental competence. So he's written hundreds of articles on this. He's he's if you haven't read anything of, of Chris Futner's, he's an extremely amazing person to read his his things. And he asked parents how they felt like good parents and what made them feel competent and good. And actually, he's got all these intervention based on the parental sense of competence. So when he asked parents, how, what does it take for you to feel like a good parent? Parents answered 20 different things. These are the themes, the most important themes, the 12 ones, um, the most important ones are there. And of course, for parents, to say, I want to know everything that's happening and make informed medical decisions, it may not be the same parents that I want to make sure my child is loved, or I want to always be at my child's side. And depending on what parents say, he's used interventions to help parents fulfill their good parent beliefs. And it actually improves uh, parents' um, outcomes and children's outcomes. So I told Chris, hey, yay, that's really nice. Let's do this in neonatology. Um, and it actually didn't work, work as we planned because the question of Chris was what helps you feel like a competent parent and like a good parent. And many of the parents in our unit said, well, I don't really feel like a parent um, for different reasons. Um, there's so much technology, the baby was taken out of me, the technology is doing my job, my baby doesn't look, I'm not attracted to my baby, I don't feel like I love my baby, I'm afraid to lose my baby, so I don't want to get attached. For so many different reasons explored in this article, many parents did not even feel like parents. And a lot of, especially moms, felt like bad mothers, unfortunately, they felt guilt. It's because of me. Like, I should be doing this job, and the machines are doing my job. I have an incompetent cervix, right? We use all these failure terms, failure to progress, incompetent cervix, but do not feel guilty. Like, we don't speak of incompetent penises when, when men have problem making babies. But in obstetrics, there's so much failure talk that not only did the moms, some of the moms, not feel like mothers, they felt like bad mothers. Um, and when they started to feel like mothers and not bad mothers, only then could they start feeling like good parents. And it's very, very easy in neonatology to, with one little comment, get the parent back into the guilt. I'm not a parent. I shouldn't be a parent. I, I expulse my kid too early. And all these words that parents will say um, or will think without saying them. So how can we do this? How to address the guilt? You'll see everything that's in italics, um, italics, whatever you pronounce it in English, in the presentation is what parents have used in our studies to say, this was the best sentence I heard. It made me feel so much better because we said, what are the best three things you heard during the hospitalization? So the quotation marks you see is the best three things some of the parents have heard. Um, so how to address the guilt? Um, is to tell the parents. As a good parent, we always think about what we could have done. And you have to know there's nothing you could have done to prevent what's happened to your baby or what's happening to your baby. And to be honest, in neonatology, 98% of the times it's true because we're not oncologists and we're not lung specialists for adult in adult medicine. We're neonatologists. And generally, I tell parents, because we can swear in Quebec, that nature fucked up and it's not their fault. I mean, they're dealing with what happened the best they can, and there's nothing they could have done. And I repeat that to parents every day, because there's a big difference between hearing it and really feeling it. Then what can we do for bonding? Um, it's to actually recognize this, um, that some parents don't feel like parents. Um, so examples of what helped other parents, what they heard, many parents when they arrive feel anxious. Some tell us they don't feel like parents. This is normal at the beginning, but it will change and will be with you all the way. Um, some parents say they're afraid to visit. This may be normal at first, but will be there to support you. It will get better. You would be surprised how many parents, if you tell them, some parents hate kangaroo care. 
how many say, oh, it's such a relief to hear because it's very stressful to some families. And as a personal example, I was the kangaroo person. I really hated it. Um, in the first weeks when I thought the baby would die, the bratties, the high frequency, the oxygen, I couldn't deal with it. Um, so instead of saying you will love kangaroo care to a parent who may not feel like a parent, may feel guilty, does not want to be there, and then just feels additional stress, is to recognize kangaroo care is helpful, that for some parents, it feels very stressful and not very pleasant, but eventually most of the parents feel close and we will be with you through the whole process. To say to a parent, you'll see all the mothers love kangaroo care and the mom's like, I don't love it. I'm not a good mom. I shouldn't be here. This reinforces this, this what's in her head. On the other hand, to say some parents love it and other parents feel very anxious, there's space to actually grow and at some point like it. And these are all examples of what families have reported that really helped them, like their best sentence that they've heard in their whole hospitalization. So I, I use now some of these sentences regularly in my daily life because I know that Parents feel empowered when we thank them, when we say their child is lucky to have them, when we say, oh, you know, it's because of your milk, grâce, because of your milk that your baby, thanks to your milk that your baby's growing that much. Um, so these are all sentences that are very useful for families and feel empowering and make them feel like good parents. So that's the, the that was the medium of, of the pyramid, there's the, the basics to use the names to sit down to say why you're there. And then in the middle to try to decrease guilt and empower families. And now that family integrated care is what's um, the new, a new tag for what was at some point family centered care and at some point patient centered care, the vocabulary changes about every five years. And that philosophy of care has changed, but it's existed in many countries for many years and in many units. So it's not something new, it's something that a lot of us have been doing. And the idea is a transfer of care from admission to discharge from the clinical team to the parents. And it's it, it looks new because there's a new FICARE tag, but it's not that new. And you all know about the Swedish experience or the Nordic experience where uh, parents can sleep in the unit, can sleep with their babies on a respirator on their chest. They don't have uh, at all the infection control that we have in our unit because you can see this kid like lying on the bed, eating snacks uh, with an iPad. This would be unthinkable with our, our, our uh, germ police in our unit. Um, but this exists in their units and is found to be very useful. This article is very interesting. Um, these are parents preparing their baby for the x-ray. Um, this is a child being taken his um, something out of his pick line by the nurse, but the mom is, is actually sleeping there and holding her baby. All these babies are intubated and very sick. They're not unlike basic room air CPAP. So FICARE or fa family integrated care is becoming the norm since the publication in the Lancet, uh, Child Adolescent Lancet in 2018. It, they didn't show that much. It, it improved breast, breastfeeding rates, parental anxiety and depression, but the inclusion criteria were um, very um, severe. I, the, in order to be a parent included in that trial, you needed to be at the bedside eight hours per day. So it's almost like asking somebody who runs the half marathon, are you interested to run the marathon? And then giving them a nutritionist and everything and a trainer and say, oh, well, it works well because they can run the marathon. But they really selected a, a group of parents that it's a biased group of parents. So since that publication, there's been a lot of QI projects um, around where I talk at conferences, I hear all those kind of QI projects, such as the goal is that X percent of parents present their baby at clinical rounds or there during intervention to feed their baby, uh, have a skin to skin care in the first two hours after birth. So there's all these goals to reach 
to increase the proximity between what we think parents should do and what parents are doing currently. So we're at, um, our experience with family integrated care is we weren't too, too bad in our group, but when we were invited to be part of that study, um, we have a PATH, uh, Partenariat Famille, Family Integrated Care for the past 10 years a unit um, in, in St. Justin or committee where there's parents and social workers, uh, RTs, nurses, it's extremely interdisciplinary. Uh, I'm the only doctor in there and we're 30 and most of them are not physicians because I'm the only one. And they didn't want to be part of the FICARE randomized trial because they're like, well, the people who need the FICARE is those who don't meet inclusion criteria. Um, and people actually disagreed to be part of that meeting, of, of that study. Most of them didn't be part of that study. So we weren't part of the study, but we actually created a study of our own. And our QI project was born, and you can read the results of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll run through the, the essential results. So we thought we'd examine what do parents think about being integrated for all these things, and what do clinicians think? And the end, we will implement changes that are meaningful for families and nurses. So we for three months, we asked everybody in the unit, all the clinicians um, and all the professionals, pharmacy, clerks, um, uh, psychologists, social workers, RTs, nurses, fellows, neonatologists, and we interviewed the parents in the unit that were there for more than a month, and also those who came a year post-discharge in the follow-up clinic to say, what do you think now that you know what you know, and also what do you think right now to have different perspectives. The questionnaire was co-constructed by the PATH group, so very interdisciplinary, and for each clinical item we asked the participant in the questionnaire, in the NICU at the present time, can parents do whatever, change the oxygen concentration? And then in another column, ideally, if parents would want to, should parents be able to change the oxygen concentration? So that's what the questionnaire looked like on the unit at the moment. And then ideally, if they wanted to, could they do this? And then there was an open-ended question of how can we optimize integration of parents in the unit? So we had 30, 331 participants over that, that um, three-month period. And for basic care items, almost all participants answered it occurred in the unit and it should be the standard of care. So the questionnaire looked like this on the unit at the moment, sur l'unité en ce moment, oui is yes. And ideally, idealement, yes. So it, like, for example, giving the bath is yes, yes. Parents should be able to give the bath, to change the diaper. Um, and you can read that most of the first page was basic care item. Read to baby, sing to baby, be there for vaccination, express their opinions, be there at rounds, uh, ask questions during rounds. Most people said it's happening, it should always happen. For more medical items, it was very interesting. Parents were all different, but all the physicians wanted more. So the majority of physicians wished for increased involvement everywhere, generally more than other clinicians and especially more than parents. So for example, when we asked tube feeding, 42% of parents wrote, ideally, no, parents should not be able to tube feed in the unit. Half the parents did not want to present their child at rounds. Half the parents did not want to be at resuscitations or intubations. On the other hand, the vast majority of physicians wanted parents to be there and to do those things. Parents identified important uh, elements in family integrated care and making a parent feel like a good parent. And these are all quotations when we use, what can we do to help you? They actually said, reported that it really helped them. For example, feel like a mother. You can see this mom said, I, I failed my birth, but I can help her heal. Another mother said, I wanna be a specialist of my baby for the non-medical aspects. It helped me be a father for real. So you can read all the, these comments that family integrated care is beneficial for many families. 
On the other hand, there were downside of family integrated care of sometimes feeling like family imposed care for some families. So this is an example of a mother who had kids at home and a kid in the unit and an exhausted husband who said, I feel guilty all the time. I feel guilty at home. I feel guilty on the unit. Um, uh, my husband exhausted. I wish they understood just asking us hurts. And this is a comment from a father um, who was speaking about uh, giving, giving, the gavash to, giving the gavash to his baby, the tube feeding. Uh, I don't know, this is not what I see myself doing as a parent, like inserting a tube myself so my baby can eat. This is a medical thing and I want to be a dad. The goal is that she'll come home without the tubes. This was true for that baby. So I really wanna focus on being there with her, not learn to become a nurse. So some parents actually thought we were forcing them to not follow the parent role and they really didn't feel comfortable at all in that role, especially if it was something temporary. This is a disclosure of one of the editorials of my, my life. Um, so that's Violette 18 years ago at 24 weeks. At that point, 24 weeks was very fragile, um, extremely sick on the respirator. And we had a policy that they created, so I can't blame anybody, I'm blaming myself, that parents should take their baby in a kangaroo skin to skin in the first 24 hours. And that was extremely important. And I'm a pig head, so we made sure that this happened and this was happening to 100% of families. Then when it was me, I'm like, no, 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 I'm not holding Violette. I mean, she's sick, she's, her tube, you know, at like 0.3 up, down, x-rays up, down, too low, too high. Um, and there's not that much evidence for 24 weekers who have, you know, a ET tube at 4.5 centimeters that kangaroo care helps because it's less than 28 weeks or less than 32 weeks. So I reviewed the literature and decided that my protocol didn't apply to me and that I didn't want to take my baby. Um, and I would wait for her to be more stable and me to feel less guilty to, to get through this. And um, the nurses decided to change the incubator um, and there was no cell phones taking picture. Though this was really taken in a well in, by a well-intentioned nurse. So when I visited, there they had my baby. They were changing the incubator, and they're like, "You don't want to do kangaroo, but hold her while we're changing the incubator." Um, and that was one of the lowest uh, ever periods during the hospitalization. What followed is that for the next two weeks, I only visited um, for half an hour during change of shift to make sure nurses would not give me my baby or pull another trick like this. So beware of, of trying to help parents when they're very vulnerable. So when we ask parents, how can we help you? You see, we saw extremely positive things. Um, parents asked us to see meet other parents in the unit, um, some old parents, they're called veteran parents in, in the US. Uh, parents appreciated clinicians so much. Um, they thanked the nurses um, a lot more than the other clinicians. Uh, the cl physicians were totally for more FICARE fi fi everywhere all the time. Half the nurses were extremely passionate, but another half were very critical. Um, the responsibility, um, the role of the parents, the role of me as a nurse, the safety of patients. And the biggest irritant for parents when we asked them how can you we help you was the variation in nursing practice, which led to polarization in the good nurse and the bad nurse and the parents feeling judged. This was often about kangaroo care, a nurse saying the baby was too sick for kangaroo and an hour later, why didn't we do kangaroo today? Or about breastfeeding, you can't breastfeed, you breastfeed, you shouldn't bottle feed, you should bottle feed and different ways to feed the baby. So after all these findings, what did we do in our unit? Um, we worked on the areas where the parents were most dissatisfied and where the team was least resistant to change. So we really had strict protocol of what was stable enough, for example, from kangaroo care. And we developed about seven like feeding protocols about when a baby's ready. And it was not nurse or doctor specific, but now it's very baby specific. And the parents are aware of these protocols and where they are in that trajectory. 
our discharge was like abysmal uh, discharge planning and preparation and now it's i think mediocre <laughs> it's it's not the best but we've improved and we've got huge committees but it's it's moving i think a bit too slowly but it will move better and we're informing parents better of the trajectory of their child in um, many different ways that I'll tell you about in a moment. And we waited to implement what was not important to parents and where there were higher resistance to change from nurses. So for example, parents giving tube feeds, it happens a lot that babies leave with tube feeds. So of course, a lot of parents give them before going home with them, but not all the parents. Uh, changing oxygen level, um, it's done in a lot of Nordic countries. Our RTs were not enthusiastic. Um, our nurses were not enthusiastic. The doctors were super enthusiastic, uh, but the parents were not enthusiastic at all. So it's really not that important if parents don't want to do it and nobody else wants to do it in the unit except doctors to move forward. And we've started to speak differently about parental preference for medical items. And um, the following slide is, is one that most helped me in my career and that now I use all the time uh, in clinical practice is how to ask parents. And this is a quote from a 24, a mom of a 25 week baby who says, just asking, do you want to be there during the intubation makes me think that I need to be there, that this is what good parents do. And I want to be a good mother or show them I'm good. What kind of parent wants to leave their child when asked if they want to stay? If there's no good answer, they should say something like, some parents want to be there during the intubation. It makes them feel in control. For these parents, um, it, it's better to see. And for other parents, it's different. Seeing an intubation on their child is too stressful and does not help them of their family. What kind of parent are you? And I use that now for everything. Um, what kind of parent are you? Do you want in prenatal consults? Do you want a lot of information? Some parents want articles, information, and other parents want the big picture. What kind of parent are you? Do you want to know how the respirator works? Some parents really want that. Others can't be bothered. I don't want to know how my car works, for example. So I, if the mechanic explains it to me, I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to nod um, absentmindedly. So that is something some parents other parents is something that is extremely valuable um, to use in practice how do we inform new parents of the trajectory of their child we have now prenatal um, support groups we never call support groups support groups because dads don't come to whatever is called a support group so if we call it a workshop a lot of people are there so if ever you start support groups just call it workshops Many people come. Um, so we have a, a prenatal workshop called Ombrel, where we speak about what the NICU looks like, uh, how to be a parent, um, how what is skins to skin, what are visitation policies, everything, and then they get an NICU visit. We have a welcome booklet that was written by parents for other parents, and we've um, put clinician pictures, whatever they thought was important. Uh, we have videos made by the, the family partnering team. Um, we have a library with many books. Um, and in the, the video of the visit of the unit, there's many parents telling new parents what it will feel like, um, what it feels like at first, what to expect. Um, and this was found to be um, beneficial. Parents wanted stories of other families other than what they the found on the internet. If you go on right now, Mur de l'Espoir, le, le, it's um, Espoir, Hope, the Hope Wall in our unit, there's stories of, and there's videos of all these um, children. And we've chosen a representative population. It's not all kids who are miracles and can climb the Kilimanjaro and have a Nobel Prize. Most of them are children who, some of them ha having no disability, others disability. Sometimes you'll see there's twins of one of the two died. There's one kids, one kid in there who um, died. There's different kind of stories um, that are representative of the NICU. Um, 
educational workshops for parents. We do one, we ask them what they like, what would they like differently, what should we do next? So there's more and more um, workshops on the unit um, that were actually hybrid or, or uh, only um, on the internet during COVID and now uh, back in person. A resource parent in the unit, or you call them veteran parents, uh, really helps parents. Um, it decreases isolation and gives hopes to new parents. Um, and we have the checklist of what they can speak about and how to manage uh, these educational groups in the unit. And just to finish, there's a lot of interventions that help families. I'm giving you examples from my unit, and I'm the spokesperson for our family partnership group, but there's so many things that work uh, in units. Um, and this is a list, uh, mindfulness yoga for families, massage for parents, a navigator app, um, coping kids, beads of courage, a super unit has that. And so these are what has been published that our very small center initiative with parents being satisfied. There's also so many amazing programs. When I vis visit units, I find all these initiatives are so amazing. And often they're built around a champion in the unit. So in one unit I visited, one of the neonatologists and the nurses, they're like gung-ho runners, and they've started a walking and a running group. And it really helps a lot of parents. Um, there's a unit where the psychologist at shop, the psychologist knits, he knits with dads. I mean, I could never have that in my unit. Like we're all like knitting losers in our unit and nobody could have that kind of championship to be able to have that program. I'm like, are you serious? You're doing this and it's working. Um, and yes, because that psychologist is an absolute super man who has a lot of talent and is very good at doing that. There's units with boxing rooms, lavender rooms, free gym memberships. And in all those units, there were champions who made this possible. The other big problem I see with all these family initiatives, they're not, they're not a problem, these initiatives, but doctors and scientists are a problem because then they say, well, there's a lack of robust evidence to apply this in our unit. And the lack of robust evidence, I don't find is a problem to try something in our, our, your unit. Because in most of these studies, not all parents will start knitting or will do yoga or will go run or will use the app. So in our peer-to-peer -peer publication, many parents did not participate, more than half. And we asked them, why don't you participate? A lot said, oh my God, I don't want to be in a group right now. I'm not a group person. Or I get support elsewhere. I have a social worker. I've got friends. I'm on an online support group. I do very well there. I don't want to be with another mom who cries. I can't tolerate this. And that's fine. But a lot of parents like that. So unfortunately, all the interventions are based on quantitative psychological measures where less parents participate and not all the parents can demonstrate some quantitative benefit, but they actually say it helps them. So my overall goal is perhaps to create a catalog of interventions and then every unit to say, well, you could try all of these ones. If you hate yoga, maybe you'll like it now. Uh, try knitting, try going to take a walk, try the lavender room, try the boxing room. And at some point you'll find at least something to get this team out of your system and to help you. Of course, all these interventions depend of unpositive leaders in unit and they'll be very different. So what do we use in our unit is the plan to check acts who should be on the team of trying to do something else positive. What are the best solution for our unit? Who's resistant to change? Who are the champions? What to check and measure eventually? Keeping in mind the potential harm. I, it really, I think it's because I've been a, a, a guilt feeling like a, a mother who felt so much guilt during the NICU hospitalization that I could imagine what could have happened if, if I had been in some of these intense QIs of skin to skin in the first 24 hours or the QI goals I've seen in some unit um, 
80% of parents should present at rounds by one month or 80% of moms should feed from the breast or 80% of parents should be there at resuscitation. Um, well, I could resuscitate my own baby. I, I would have never wanted to be there at resuscitation. Um, so the changes need to respect the reality of the NICU, but also the reality of, of parents. And this will be affected by social characteristics. We have a year maternity leave, so it's easier to be on the unit than if you have one month maternity leave, for example. So it's, it's very easy to make family integrated care, family imposed care in some circumstances. And how can we choose our battle? So recently I was in a unit where they had they wanted 80% of parents to present their kids during rounds at one month of hospitalization. But in that same state, there was no parental leave more than one month and the parking was 20 US dollars. And um, maybe you should choose your battles and people are, oh, we can't do anything. Yeah, of course you can go to the state and you could actually as neonatologists write something about the fact that parents in the NICU don't have parental leave. Like you have some power to at least have your voice heard. And maybe other in that same units, they, they were all rounding, they were 15 in that mom's room, all standing up behind their computer, speaking to the mom like this, um, and honestly, just bringing a chair and having three people doing round and just doing the basics, sitting down, asking, how do you find your baby, letting the mom speak for a minute and speaking about the life trajectory would be way more beneficial than being 15 people behind the computer. So sometimes it's easy things that can be changed before very complex things. And often it's systems changes. Um, uh, we had, we're in a new unit that's amazing, but we moved to the new unit where there's no chairs, they're all bolted in the wall. So you can't sit next to the, 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 the bed of the kid and next to the mom because of apparent security reasons, because we'll kill ourselves tripping on a chair because apparently we can't see them. So um, then the family and, and, and the family, the path Partenaria Family Group went to the administrators to say, we need chairs to sit down during rounds and we need chairs in every, and this has been proven to help parents when we sit down and we spend time with them. And then the same thing with the kid's name in the, in our healthcare system, the baby's under the mother, cause it's a universal a free, whatever health, covered healthcare system. So we can't know the baby's name. So how can we make this possible? Um, in a unit where you arrive quickly, there are 75 kids. So how do you know who's who doing during a resuscitation or a decompensation? So often it's not just individuals, but it, it's systems that can be changed. So the take home message is that, as you all know, the NICU is a place of trauma and celebration. Um, NICU families also experience positive transformation Supporting parenthood and helping parents feel like good parents is a very important goal. And it's very easy to say just one little thing for a parent to feel like a bad parent. Careful implementation of family integrated care models are very promising and each NICU and country is different and each family is also different and veteran resource parents can help new and ICU parents. So this is, um, if ever you didn't see Red M's work, you can also use it in your presentation. Red Method is a Quebec photographer who's taken pictures of kids with their NICU pictures and they're uh, very positive for families. And he was a preemie himself. Um, his name is Red because his mom's like, I don't know what to call him. He looks red. Let's call him Red. Um, <laughs> so, but if you look, Les Prématurés, Red Method. This is Violette, my daughter. She's she's older now, holding her um her an ICU picture. So I'll stop sharing so I can take questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Annie for this incredible talk. Um, so I do have a few questions in the moment. So I, I've i listened to your talk several times and every time I just learned something new. 
the VA practice. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. The, yeah, the first question I have is, um, what QI goals do you suggest? I know you said, uh, don't use this and um, skin to skin or breastfeeding or, so is there any particular QI goals that we should consider using it? I would really bad of saying, please don't use breastfeeding in kangaroo care. I believe skin to skin helps and first breastfeeding is very good. Um, well, it's to measure what's happening in your unit and look at what is most deficient and where people want to move, including parents. So it, we were looking at family integrated care for um, changing oxygen and skin to skin, but we realized parents were very satisfied and clinicians were satisfied, but everybody was dissatisfied with discharge. We thought we were pretty good, but then we realized we're pretty shitty, like very bad. And the examples given by parents were um, we didn't know about all these things and all these problems they had and the fact that the appointments had not been taken when they left. There's like a page of a hundred things that we did badly. Um, so why don't we work on things that parent really don't appreciate in our unit? And for like working on the base is I think the most important. Is there a chair in the unit? Are people rounding, sitting down? Or do they know the name of the baby? is every time the baby entering a room, acknowledging there's a parent and just saying, hi, I'm the RT. I'm there to change the respirator settings. Everything's going well with your baby or with Samuel. So I think implementing the basics and just having a little temperature of your unit of what is happening well and what's not happening well. Because what we think doctors is not happening well is really misleading often. It's not what parents feel. Thank you. And your unit op of wall, is it available to others to view? The picture, the video that you mentioned for your unit, is it available for others to Yeah, look there's at that? one picture presents your unit in French, but you can see the gist of it. Um, the bienvenue, the welcome to neonatology, there's an English version. Um, I can send you all the papers. And okay. the, the video was very useful during COVID, because before they came to visit the unit, you know, when they knew the baby would be go there. But afterwards, the video was also seen a mom let you go get a baby by transport that she can see this is where my baby is. This is where, I'm, oh, there's a mom saying the unit is a bit scary and it gets better. So already the mom feels welcomed uh, in the unit. Thank you. And we have a trainees listen to the recordings too. Any quick advice on what to avoid during prenatal consultation? I know you wrote a personalized prenatal um, consultation and um, standardized way of delivering. So any tips on how we can personalize our prenatal consultation? It's the some parents, other parents. And I the things I teach trainees is you know the name of your baby, sit down. Um, let the parent speak for a minute. It's very hard to wait a minute um, <laughs> when you're a trainee or a doctor and or any kind of clinician. Um, and to it's hard for trainees because when they're residents, not fellows, they change specialty every month. So so parents are like, oh, now I'm the cardiac person. Now I'm the GI person. Now I will, I'm now in the NICU person. Get parents get super mixed up. So to say what your role is. And to use the some parents, other parents, uh, this I learn, I've learned most of what I know with parents, because parents told me in my studies what they didn't like to hear. And sometimes I was one of the people using these sentences and what parents like to hear. And the some parents, other parents works very well, like prenatally. Some parents want a lot of information and other parents just want the ballpark. And and many parents just want the ballpark. Some parents want the written documentation that I have here for you and others don't want it. It speaks about everything that can happen to your baby. They don't want it. But then we say, oh, we did the consult. Parents were in shock. They didn't understand. They just didn't listen. <laughs> like if, if you're not interested, whatever my accountant tells me or the person who repairs my car, I don't want to know anything. Just do my accounts and repair my car. I don't, I, I don't want to be explained what's going on. But some parents are like that in the unit too. And then we think they don't understand, but they didn't want to know whatever we've told them. Okay. Thank you, Annie. And um, I think we 
Um, I have to move to our next talk. And um, so thank you. Thank you for this incredible talk. And uh, we might to invite you again to share your research work later on. Thank you, Annie. And I will hand it over to Morgan. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate your authenticity being a parent and a physician. Um, I'd like to introduce Linda Frank. She's going to be talking about next level family centered care. And um, she holds the Jack and Elaine Cohen Endowed Chair in Pediatric Nursing at the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing, and co directs the Action Fellowship Program in Reproductive Health and Justice. Professor Linda Frank holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive uh, Sciences, excuse me, and is an affiliate member of the Big. Marvin B. Kennedy Health Charity Center at UCSF, a family centered care oh, and family centered services in all settings where children receive health care globally. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I think internet. Okay, sorry about that. Um, where did you hear me leave off? <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure people can read my bio. It's fine. Well, Linda, it's it's a it's an impressive one. So I'll go ahead and chat it in. <laughs> no worries, no worries at you all. Can stop sharing the screen, Morgan. Sure. Thank you. So hi, everyone. It's um, a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon and or whatever time zone you're in and to um, be able to um, share the webinar with uh, Annie. Um, always appreciate hearing your perspectives and your expertise and uh, experience. Um, uh, I guess the the piece that's not in my bio is how I come to this work. I am not a parent, um, but I have played many roles in the NICU. Um, I've been a bedside nurse. I trained as a clinical nurse specialist. I was a nurse manager, a hospital administrator. Um, I am still an educator and a researcher um, for many years. And uh, my most favorite role is being a co-researcher uh, with parents and families. And um, so that's the lens that I um, come to uh, this work with you. Um, so it's an honor to be here. And uh, a shout out to, especially to all the nurses on the webinar. Um, so I'm gonna just give you um, a quick drive-by on some uh, research that's come out of our work in the US and some thoughts um, about this whole issue around family-centered care, family-integrated care, and how we can move forward to uh, implement things and ultimately make for a better uh, family experience and outcomes for um, uh, babies and their families. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to just uh, hope that we can talk about the FICARE model, um, uh, have some different perspectives than what's been shared. Um, so I'd like to offer those in terms of some more specificity about um, how I think the FICARE model has evolved, how it's differed from family center care, and uh, just a quick, uh, some thoughts about some of the uh, evidence that's emerging. Um, then I'd like to share our new research findings uh, from FICARE in the US and uh, some comments around tools for implementing FICARE um, uh, and family-centered care um, at the next level in uh, NICUs, um, in, particularly in the US setting, where I think in some ways we're really behind the rest of the world. Okay, so um, just a, a little bit of framing. I think um, this, you know, um, Annie talked about some of these issues in her remarks, um, and I just have been pondering this for quite a few years and thinking about all the different interventions and the ways that uh, families are supported and just try to come up with an organization or what we call maybe a taxonomy of how to, how to just organize and think about the different interventions um, as the research and the evidence continues to build. So um, at a base, you know, we can talk about parent support interventions, the things that we that parents need as as a, a foundation. So Annie, uh, you know, talked beautifully about the importance of communication, the importance of language. Um, these really are at a base as a foundation, as she said. 
Um, parent psychological support is a foundational issue that needs to be addressed in some ways, and there are many different evidence-based ways that this can occur. Uh, parent education, whether it's individual, whether it's done at the bedside, whether it's done in groups, you know, again, these are there's are evidence-based ways to do this, um, but but parents need education to be in order to be parents of babies who have, um, you know, a, a neonatal healthcare issue. Um, we need a supportive physical environment. We need supportive institutional and social policies. And Parents need support after discharge. So these are sort of foundational things, um, and there are different ways to do them, and we can discuss and debate about the right ways to do them, but they are the foundational elements. And then there's another set of um, things that, that need to be done, which are what we've termed parent-delivered intervention. So the first bucket are things that you know, you need to provide um, for parents or make available to parents. Uh, but these are things that actually you need the parents to do. They don't happen without the parent. So, for example, to really be able to understand uh, the baby's signals and signs, um, we really need parent input, parent observations of their baby, as well as the clin clinician. Um, massage, you know, again, parent massage, if you call it parent massage, if parents are doing it, you need the parent. Skin to skin care really is a parent delivered intervention. Infant feeding, um, again, th there may be different phases in which that needs professional uh, input or professions, uh, professionals to be doing the technical part of it, but ultimately parent uh, parents do feed their baby. It is part of the parental role, and we need to support that. And parents need to be able to um, uh, do that at some point, and I would argue earlier than later. Um, developmentally supportive care, again, something that requires parent input, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are some of the parent delivered interventions. And, you know, again, there's different levels of evidence, emerging evidence, and, um, but we need to think about how to engage parents in those if those are going to be offered and supported. And then the last level in this model is, is, or in this taxonomy is really about the models of care. And so this, these are things that happen at a structural level. They're at an organizational level, at the NICU level, um, where you have to organize teams and include parents as partners in these, but it, it's a system level uh, intervention as opposed to something that's done just on an individual basis or just for um, a few people. So that's how I, it's helpful for me to think about these things and try to distinguish them because it can get quite confusing. And I would invite your input um, on that. And um, we've already, this is actually the second iteration of this model. So um, it, it will continue to evolve um, and would love input on that. Um, so moving uh, uh, from that, then let's talk about family-centered care. Um, and it, it started out really as a philosophy um, or as principles, um, which then get implemented um, at an individual unit level uh, or even patient level um, with you know, different ways of implementation. Um, but in the figure, you see some of the core principles of it. And, uh, you know, again, I think if we are true to the model of uh, family-centered care, we don't get into family-imposed care because by definition and by the principles, uh, it requires respect and dignity and negotiation and, info and, and information sharing and all of those things so that it should be something that isn't imposed ever. Um, so if we're, if we're drifting into thinking that we're doing family imposed care, then really what we're talking about is, you know, drifting away from, um, you know, the core principles of family centered care. Um, but we talk about parents um, being supported to be active partners in shared decision making and in direct caregiving. And again, we need both of those uh, components. Um, we also have um, approaches, you know, these approaches, uh, we have uh, evidence to show that when they are implemented, that you can improve both parent and infant outcomes. So there is a research and evidence base for this. But the real issue with family-centered care as it's currently 
talked about and practiced is that it's inconsistent. And you know, this comes up time and time and again, it's inconsistent within the units, um, person to person, um, and also across units. And that makes it really difficult on a lot of levels. And we're always gonna have this tension because we need things that are both um, you know, structurally um, available and, and, and accessible, but also flexible to be able to uh, you know, meet the principles of them respecting people's autonomy and decision-making and um, you know, negotiating uh, the, the solution. So there will always be this tension, but we've sort of drifted into it being called everything and anything and not having um, metrics to go al along with that. So that's the problem of the current uh, setting. And so where, where things have moved to is looking at other ways of, of trying to address some of that inconsistency. And that's where family integrated care emerged as a model. Um, and it really, it came up, um, you know, and, and uh, the, the study from O'Brien was cited as sort of the first um, major multinational uh, multi-site cluster trial of this model of care. Um, to really try to address some of the inconsistencies and to see if we could move the needle on um, outcomes um, by providing uh, a more structured approach. So uh, family integrated care is based on family-centered care principles. Um, it does provide the structure. It is co-designed with parents, and that's a really important part of the program um, that it you know that each unit that adopts a family integrated model is uh, you know does use a co-design approach with um, parents in that local community and, and culture because um, that is really really important um, and the goal is again similar to um, uh, with uh, family centered care uh, principles as helping parents to become the primary caregivers and full partners in the care of their infant. And there are some core activities as you can that are built in uh, according to the pillars of FICARE, um, but these are localized to uh, local setting uh, context and they can be supplemented with other evidence-based family-centered care or developmental care practice. So it's an open, um, flexible system, but it provides a way of making sure that the core supports are available um, and accessible. So there is a growing literature of, of uh, evidence around FICARE. Um, I think Annie mentioned some of the quality improvement work, um, but you'll find on the familyintegratedcare.com uh, site a number of papers and um, things. Uh, the research is growing. Um, in, and it is a worldwide research uh, literature, not just uh, North America based, um, but there's improved feeding and breastfeeding, weight gain has been demonstrated, post-discharge neurodevelopment and decreased risk of sepsis um, are some of the things uh, that have been found in, in different studies um, in different contexts. Um, for parents, um, lower maternal stress uh, during the NICU stay and some evidence of lower chronic stress at 18 months, um, greater confidence in caregiving and improved communication between parents and the healthcare team. Um, and for NICU staff, uh, greater satisfaction and role fulfillment has been documented in a few studies. So there are uh, potentially some benefits to the health system as well. Um, but but the challenge here and the challenge that I was most interested in um, in uh, looking at is the issue of um, this dissonance between how FI, the FICARE model is being adopted in other countries around the world and yet seems to be um, uh, not taken up in any um, noticeable way in the U.S. context. And so I was very curious about that. And uh, we then embarked upon um, that research. So um, I'm going to talk about now um, just our work with a couple of these, uh, uh, with our study in, in California, we had um, uh, three uh, very diverse NICUs participate. Um, two of the papers um, with the infant outcomes and the maternal outcomes uh, have been published. And so I'm going to just skim the methods very, very quickly and refer you to the papers. They're um, both open access. And um, we've got a couple other papers coming out with some staff outcomes and then uh, some parent um, uh, experience. So uh, you can look out for those. 
Um, but just very briefly, um, we had these three NICUs. One was an academic uh, site, one was a freestanding children's hospital, and one was a very large community um, uh, uh, level three NICU. Um, we used a, um, a time lag design where we first measured very in a very granular level the family centered care. Uh, that was uh, taking place in all the units. We then paused for training in FICARE and then enrolled a uh, cohort um, who, uh, who participated in the FICARE um, model. Um, I'll say more about the model in a minute. Um, our inclusion criteria were similar to the other studies um, that focused on preterm infants, uh, 33 weeks gestation or uh, less, but one of the differences in our study is we did not exclude for other diagnoses like um, search, uh, babies that needed surgery or had other uh, conditions, so it was more uh, inclusive of um, the full range of um, presentation of, pre of prematurity. Um, and we um, also had a mobile component uh, and provided um, smartphone or, or tab we provided tablet access if there was not smartphone access um, for the family so that they could participate. Um, we also did not have a minimum bedside time requirement. And one of the things we were interested in is around the time uh, spent uh, in the program um, and, and uh, at, the, uh, at the bedside. Um, and we did cross over into uh, COVID during the time period of recruitment um, before we closed the study, but there wasn't a huge overlap. And um, in sensitivity analysis, we didn't see um, any difference. Uh, some of these units were able to keep um, elements of the program running in the early uh, part of the pandemic. So we um, did not um, uh, delete uh, those uh, participants from the analysis. Um, so let me uh, pause and uh, say more about the, the bundle. Um, so in the M5 care group, um, we had six components, and I'll, I'll go into those a little bit more in the next slide because I think it's important to see um, what those really are. Um, but just to say, um, we made sure that parents were offered all of the components. It was offered on a unit-wide basis for most of the components, but um, only the uh, families that met the inclusion criteria um, participated in the research, but we didn't exclude other families from participating if they wanted to, but without participating in the research. And we did a lot to ensure fidelity and uh, booster training and support for the staff. And then for the usual uh, uh, FCC group, um, they just had their usual care defined by the sites. Um, and uh, they had uh, parents had access to the mobile app, which we added as a component to the FICARE. That's where the M comes from. So let me walk you through those components a little bit more. So the first um, of the components is the supportive physical environment, um, which was co-designed with parents uh, and has had protocols and policies that were very much following what uh, Annie talked about in terms of there being a very good welcome uh, education and support for families um, as they were admitted. Um, the introduction of their, you know, of them as the language around them being essential partners of care and not visitors, um, uh, making sure that there were uh, appropriate furniture for them to be welcomed at their baby but as baby's bedside, um, you know, all of the basics uh, to make sure um, and that you know, even regardless whether it was a new unit or an older facility that parents um, uh, could be physically present and had the physical supports that they needed. Um, there was a, a investment in clinical team training and retraining um, to really talk about um, the getting everyone on the same page around um, the, the role of parents in their baby's care and the role of, of the clinical team in uh, working with families and uh, around language and around, you know, just all the th trying to work out all the issues um, ahead of time and to really do that in partnership. Um, so a, a big investment there. Um, and then uh, parents' participation in weekday rounds, I'll go into that in a little bit more. Um, uh, peer mentorship program um, 
Our parent advisors were adverse to the use of the word veteran because they felt that it had a connotation of war and mort and trauma. And so they uh, preferred um, the term uh, peer mentorship. Um, we held parent group classes, or I like the word workshop um, very much. Um, uh, we also found that parents had an aversion to the word support group as well, and so they preferred uh, classes. But really, the classes and the and the group, the power of the group is provides both support as well as um, education. And those varied between two to five times per week. We set a minimum of two, but in some of the units, the they just kept growing and growing because of interest um, and, uh, and uh, really interesting topics that people wanted to participate in. Um, and then uh, worked on expanding the role for parents and providing tools um, for tracking that because, again, the inconsistency in tracking uh, parent skill uh, acquisition and competence and confidence um, is one of the things that's a pain point uh, for families. And then lastly, the parents wanted and created a mobile app where some of that content could, uh, or the content from the other um, elements could be made available um, for parents for reinforcement, for those who weren't able to be present in person. And uh, they also had an online diary. And then we um, also used the app for all of the research data collection. So just a little bit more about rounds. Um, you know, there's this is a big, uh, we found in most of the units, this was a big cultural shift for the team and, uh, and a small cultural shift for parents, but a big cultural shift for the team. And so we worked really hard to talk through um, this and to, and to demonstrate its benefits. Um, the biggest issue uh, with parent rounds is that parents have the opportunity to have a speaking role. And even if it's just saying their baby's name and introducing them, themselves and their baby to the team, it changes the dynamic and brings them into the discussion and makes it possible for them to share observations or ask questions. Whereas if they don't, have an initial speaking role in the beginning, then it's it takes a lot for a parent to be able to, to uh, then ask questions or share observations. It just doesn't happen naturally unless they're, it's set up for them to do that. Um, so we actually recommend that um, all of the rounds start out with a script uh, for parents and that, you know, the script over time doesn't necessarily get used, but in the beginning, it's a really helpful, um, uh, just like having a checklist, if you will, at, um, in other, you know, checklists have been found to be really helpful in other uh, clinical scenarios, um, but this, uh, the, the rounds uh, uh, script is very helpful for introducing uh, the parent role to, um, to clinical rounds. Uh, so, that's what we use there. The parent mentor program, um, some of the units uh, decided to create their own and recruited uh, former NICU families, provided training. And uh, this is just a picture of one of the, the uh, them and their uh, former uh, preterm children. Um, other units uh, didn't have that resource or didn't have the champions or there wasn't, um, yeah, there just were different uh, obstacles. And so they use some of the national um, uh, resources that are um, very well um, supported and organized and uh, make uh, parent uh, mentorship available for free. So, um, you know, resource, local resources should not be a barrier to making uh, parent men uh, peer mentorship accessible to, uh, to families uh, in your units. Um, because it is available um, in that way. And so we had both models in our uh, uh, project. Um, and then here's just an example from one of the units about uh, the, the curriculum for the classes. And I say curriculum very loosely. The classes are modeled on the um, uh, 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 centering pregnancy model where it's really a, a, a based on adult learning principles and um, a, a group, it, they're not facilitated, it's not death by PowerPoint. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a, a really specific training guide for um, the facilitator and uh, they're very powerful and, um, and really effective um, and um, bring in uh, many of the um, 
the consultants to the unit um, find it uh, really uh, a great way to access more families through um, these group processes and happy to talk more about any of these things. But I just want to give you a quick drive by of this so you know what we're talking about. And then lastly, the app that was uh, family uh, developed by families um, and uh, is a way for families to track their NICU journey, both their baby's progress, keeping track of who's who, working with their, um, their baby and themselves. Um, they keep their notes for rounds. They can journal about their feelings. It has the educational content. It has peer support content and other um, uh, encouragement and support uh, for them. And here's just a picture of a dad using the app. Okay, so what did we find in the research? So first, um, just the fact that we were able to um, get the study off the ground and deliver the FICARE intervention to a high level in these three very complex, very um, diverse NICUs um, was, I think, a, a first demonstration of feasibility and acceptability. So we ended up with uh, a very diverse racial and ethnic um, sample, 77% uh, um, Black, Indigenous, or people of color participated. We had really good enrollment rates, 71% uh, of the families who were invited in the M5 care group, slightly less in the FCC group, um, mostly because of the burden of the research data collection and not feeling like they were being offered something extra. Um, but still, nonetheless, um, quite good for um, NICU research. We had very good retention rates in the study, not a lot of dropout, and there were no major baseline group differences, um, and we were able to deliver the components to our fidelity thresholds. Um, we did show that there were younger and sicker um, infants than in the previous uh, studies, and so hopefully that will lead to the generalizability of um, our findings. And, um, uh, and you know, there were no group differences in the clinical or discharge characteristics between the groups, um, even though they were sequentially um, enrolled. What we found in terms of the infant outcomes is we didn't see an overall group effect. Um, let's see if my animation will work. Yeah, we didn't see an overall group effect in weight gain. And, you know, in retrospect, or even in, in we, could, we hypothesized because we had such a wide um, inclusion criteria and a lot of surgical babies, um, uh, you know, it's probably not surprising that we didn't see um, so, uh, you know, the same weight gain effect that had been seen in prior, prior studies. Um, but when we looked at um, the per protocol, um, uh, analysis and looked at the individual components, we did see that there was an effect of having a parent mentor assigned or not assigned, but, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, being paired with a parent mentor and also an effect of rounds. Um, so parents who attended a lot of rounds, um, their babies um, uh, grew better um, than the baby, than the families who didn't. Um, so that was interesting, um, but not a major effect, but perhaps a, a signal or, or um, you know, uh, something that is of interest. Um, but what was more interesting, I think, in terms of the outcomes for the infants was a very large difference that we found um, in, 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 uh, in nosocomial infection rates between the MFI care and the family center care group that couldn't be explained by any um, uh, events that had happened in the unit or parent uh, presence at the bedside or any other things that we could um, try to look at. It seemed to be a true uh, group effect. And it also held up for when we looked at the individual components that the families, um, the, you know, for the babies whose families attended rounds and attended the group classes in particular, those um, uh, babies had uh, much fewer nosocomial infection rates, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, pretty significant. We didn't see any difference in BPD, ROP, or in um, human milk feeding at discharge. Um, in terms of the mothers, um, we looked at their symptoms of post-traumatic stress and depression after discharge. So looking at um, them about four months after they had gone, gone home, um, we would have looked at the fathers, but we didn't actually have that many who um, 
who continue to fill out the surveys in the post-discharge period. So that's still an area to be um, explored. Um, but typical rates of symptoms of either post-traumatic um, stress or depression um, in um, what's been observed in other studies. So, you know, this is a, an important issue. Um, for families um, after discharge from the NICU. Um, and we saw no overall uh, group effects. So we didn't see that um, the rates were lower for FICARE families uh, vers versus um, uh, mothers who had been uh, received uh, the family-centered care, standard care. But when we looked closer, we saw a, a, an, an interesting interaction. So if you just bear with me, I'll take you through this graph. So the blue line is the uh, mothers who uh, got FCC, and they, um, if they had low uh, stress during the NICU, um, measured by the uh, FCC um, uh, PSS uh, and ICU, um, they they were they had low uh, post traumatic stress um, after discharge, but if they were highly stressed during the NICU stay they had high rates of post-traumatic stress after discharge. So there is this interaction between stress during the nursery and, um, and stress uh, and post-traumatic stress after they go home. Um, and the gold line is the uh, mothers who are in the M5 care group. And we didn't see that same effect. So that the FICARE care um, intervention seems to be protective of having higher post-traumatic stress after discharge. And it's a, a significant effect, a, the threshold for um, clinically significant um, symptoms with this scale is around 10. So this is really quite protective. Um, so uh, this was a very interesting and important finding. And the graph looked the same. I won't show it to you just in the interest of time. Um, but the, the graph looks the same um, for depression. And also when we looked at the individual components, um, rounds and classes, it looks the same. So it does seem to be um, you know, a, a consistent effect. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be really, really quick here um, to just to say that the staff were mostly positive about it. Um, you can see the rounds, um, and particularly with the physician group, um, were uh, still, um, you know, a little concerned about rounds and how to make rounds more efficient. We have some um, uh, suggestions and things have changed post-pandemic um, that I think um, uh, can address that. Uh, but for everything else, they were quite positive. And the parents were generally positive. I won't read these quotes, um, but really the issues that brought, were brought up as um, problems with high care were really problems, uh, again, with um, individual um, inconsistency and, uh, you know, um, the inability of the system to, um, to accommodate, um, uh, you know, parents' uh, shared decision-making and, um, and uh, accommodate their um, preferences uh, for, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, participation. So, you know, as always, a work in progress. Um, but nothing um, fundamental about the protocol or the, um, the elements of the bundle. So just to summarize, um, what we've learned, I think, from this trial in a U.S. context is that it's feasible, that it's safe, and that it's, um, it's, it, it was accepted. Um, it can potentially reduce nosocomial infections among preterm infants and post-traumatic stress and depression symptoms in the mothers who have high NIC-related stress. Um, and the um, uh, the great, you know, if we're going to start somewhere, the components of peer mentorship, active participation in rounds and groups classes might be places to start because that's where we saw the strongest effect. Um, and the app, you know, maybe something that is reinforcing all of those. We did not see any specific effect of that, and that's probably not surprising. Um, I just want to highlight one other study. Um, that's been done in the U.S. Um, from Susanna um, Kubica and her group in Boston. And they um, modified the FICARE model with, uh, uh, they didn't have a peer mentor program or group classes, but they had the other elements of FICARE. And they implemented in a large level um, three in the U.S. on the East Coast. And they uh, um, implemented it unit-wide. Um, 
And what they found is that uh, parents' uh, stress was lower during the NICU uh, stay, and that parents learned more skills, and uh, those and and those who learned more skills had lower stress. Um, and they also uh, they had an app as well, and they found uh, there was improved um, uh, staff and parent communication with the app. Um, and so their conclusions were that, you know, any degree and the, you know, uh, the degree mattered um, in terms of re uh, reducing parent stress with um, FICARE, uh, modified FICARE intervention. So we now have a second study um, in the U.S. Um, pointing to uh, improvements over uh, standard family-centered care um, uh, model. So I think the main message from this is, you know, really, I love this quote from Arthur Ashe about starting where you are, use what you have and do what you can. Um, so I think the first step really is about making an assessment about what's working well and where you want to improve. I, I love the approach that Annie talked about um, that they used in their NICU with, you know, doing a very detailed assessment and inventory about what's working well and what's not. And and then and moving from there, because I think at this stage, most NICUs are not starting with, you know, a blank slate that, you know, there are already practices um, that maybe implement some elements of family centered care or fly care, uh, but not the whole bundle and not consistently. And uh, resources for um, uh, uh, all of this and all of the protocols that I talked about in a very rapid way um, and all of our uh, manuals and uh, uh, training for parent mentors and all those things are all available on the FICARE website for um, free and uh, publicly available. So you can go here to find anything. There's also great stuff from the UK and from other countries. So I think this is um, a really good resource. Um, and I think I'm out of time, but if you will indulge, indulge me, I'll just make a plea for your leadership. I mean, I think this group is phenomenal and I think you are the ones to really move the needle um, in terms of how we give care in NICUs. Um, to really take it to the next level, I think we. my um, uh, take on this is we have to, uh, you know, integrate it into our structures and how we do business in in hospitals in general. So, you know, taking doing exactly what you're doing in terms of getting uh, families to be part of committees to form family advisory councils, to family embedded in all of the committee work and the, uh, you know, the organizational structures. Um, I think that's where we're really we have to go um, and to and to work on the structure to be able to support uh, care um, improvement. Um, this is what nurses were telling us, um, but you know they are also incredibly important stakeholders in this. And so uh, we published this a couple of years ago. But you know, asking them at, uh, in and and the same level of detail about what is needed um, structurally and in terms of workflow to make. Uh, things better for um, being able to deliver consistent family-centered or family-integrated care. Um, so um, this is available, but you can also use the tools to ask these same questions for your own specific context. And uh, there has to be accountability. So looking at how we then measure and what we measure, I think really is the frontier um, at this stage. And if we can come together to come up with some consistent measures, we can then, you know, um, you know, really move the move the needle. So I will leave you with that and uh, just thank this incredibly um, uh, wonderful team that helped us get this work done. And um, you can have my uh, slides uh, for the, um, the content and um, I'm always available by email if you have more questions. So thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We've got one final slide for our future webinars. Um, we have a great lineup so far for 2024, um, as the first being our January webinar on January 11th. Um, we've got um, a lot of great uh, presentations coming up. Please stay tuned and join us for those. Um, as always, we will send out information via email to the listserv and we'll try to address any questions by um, Dr. Linda Frank as well.
Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope that you have a great weekend, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>